Hello everybody, how are you all doing? It's the Midlands Outdoors, back with Exploring the Black Country. Beautiful morning, I've come out about 7 o'clock. It's coming about 8 o'clock at the moment because I've come all the way from Miles there into the Dudley Number 2 Canal. I'm going to be covering a wide range of history today. So this section where I am now is known as the Dudley Number 2 Canal. But where we want to start our video is by the Bumbleau. We're going to show you the coal mine, Windermill End Colliery. Head down the canal, show you bits and pieces. We've got so much to cover, which is why I've got out early. So it's going to be a really interesting video. So I'll catch up with you now at the Bumbleau and let's talk about Windmill End Colliery. Here we are, the first point of the video, which is Windmill End Colliery. Let's just pan around and show you the land which surrounds the old former site of Windmill End. So you can just see there, the coal mine is right there. Have a quick zoom in. Look at that stack right the way there. It's still got one of the um, the buildings at the side. We'll go and take a look at it. But what you can see here is a bit of little information before I tell you a bit of main. So the building I was standing housed the great steam engine. This pumped water at the Windmill End Colliery. The 30 foot thick coal worked here is one of the reasons the Black Country got its name. You can just imagine, I mean, the Black Country got its name for all the coal mining industry. You imagine all the smoke. A lot of the smoke travelled around different places marking the boundaries of the black country and that's what it's all about it's about the coal mining that's what the, we're the heart of basically coal mining chain making a lot of other factory stuff as well nails i know there was like an old nailers cottage by me in alzerin and that uh, was left it's been redone up so there is some quite really interesting stuff around but let's go and take a look at windmill and colliery and we'll go up to there to the buildings just to share it you all together <laughs> So here we are, Windmill End Colliery. Look at these buildings, I mean, really how old they are. You've got the stack. You could just imagine how far this would have dated back many, many years ago. It's just so interesting. I mean, seeing where the old windows would have been, you've got stuff inside, which I'll show you in a minute. But the stack is really fascinating to me to see that. I mean, coal mine remains left in the black country. It's just absolutely crazy. But just imagine how far this dates back. I will tell you a bit of history in a bit. But what's quite on the cut, you can just see there is some still old remains. I mean, you've got this thing here, look, so there would have been an attachment there. I don't know what this is about down here. You can just see there is an arch. Now, this might have not been here, so they've probably filled it with soil. But I'm guessing that going in, that would go right the way down underground, but I think it's been capped. And you see, I don't know what this is as well. So there is like a bit of a metal thing there. A lot of metal, like, uh, rods going across look you see it's been cable tied on this section so I'm guessing that was probably uh, falling off but that is really cool seeing this I mean look up there look how tall that is up so right this way we're standing now is actually known as Cobb's engine house so you can just see right the way above me there is a little wheel peeking from a bit of metal there it's really quite interesting seeing that so Cobb's engine house was officially known as Windmill End Colliery Number no. 3 Pit, latterly pumping station and used to remove water from the coal um, deep mines. It contained a James Watt beam engine capable of pumping in the region of 367,000 gallons of water per day into the canal at Neverton near the famous Canal Tunnel. The shaft itself was 525 feet deep. Wow, that's quite cool. Seeing how the water was pumped into the canal, that is really interesting. The mine pumping engine house was erected by Sir Horace St. Paul circa 1831, later owned by Staffordshire Mines Drainage uh, Commission. Uh, let's bear one moment. It was named uh, after Farmer Cobb, who owned land in the area before the engine house was built. So, right, so where we're standing now, this is probably old farmland. That is interesting, I never knew that. So, you learn something new when reading the information. 
So it originally contained a, a single acting uh, condensing engine. The engine houses are brick construction and are three storeys with a cylinder floor at ground level, chamber floor above and the bob or beam loft. The south gable wall is thicker than the others and has a plug or a rod portal on the ground floor. Let's go and take a look and I will now show you what's on the floor. So right in the history I was on about some things on the floor. Now this is actually what these are. You can just see these actually still remain from the Cobbs engine house. Look at that. You've got three sections there. There's actually one there. And there is actually one here as well. Look. Look at that. And if I just look at the ceiling, you can just see there is old remains of things on the wall. Look, old bit of wood. You've got something there. So there might be one connection from there to there. So there would have been three stories into this Cobbs engine house, as mentioned. And I mean, looking right the way up, you can just see the wheel. Look how old that is. It's dated back quite a bit. But even with some more information, let's tell you a bit more about this uh, car mine. So right, it does say the engine house is the early surviving example of its type and one of the few engine houses left in the black country. It is now scheduled an ancient monument because it's dating back way, way back a bit. A winding engine of the Newcomen type was also here in use, but was removed from the site in 1928 and transferred to the Henry Ford Museum in Michigan, USA. So I actually did thought there was actually a part here at Windmill End that was taken all the way to the United States. I've heard people tell me about it many, many times before. So that's pretty much a Windmill End colliery, but it is an interesting place. If you've never been down to the Bumbleau, it's definitely worth getting down to here and checking it out. It is a lovely site. And with the coal mine being here, you've got your black country history as well at the same time, as well as Neverton Tunnel, which is only a short walk down to the bottom. So right, just uh, one more look. We'll have a look on the outside now, one more time. You can just see there, looking right the way up at the mine. That is just absolutely wonderful just to see that. And if I just stand back a bit of a way back, I mean, look at that from a distance. It just looks absolutely amazing with the engine house and also the stack at the same time. You could just imagine though, I mean, there would have been other things on three. You would have had like a little building possibly there. You'd have had the other thing what was removed. It's just, it's just amazing to see what that would have looked like at an early age because it is really old. And that is the oldest survivor thing in the black country of mining. I mean, there isn't many left. There is a coal mine by me that closed in the, uh, I think it was early 1900s, Horn Colliery. And that today is still classed as derelict, but I don't know what I'm doing with the land. And there is actually little buildings over there. And there's a big, massive wheel. It is absolutely wonderful. If I can get a chance one time, I will have a quick uh, sneak peek and show you that one. It is really cool, but it depends if it's all been fenced and blocked off. But yeah, lovely land, and this is actually the Warrens Hall, a back area, and the bungalow behind me. It's just amazing. Open land in some parts. You've got the coal hills over the back. You've got Neverton Tunnel just down there. And I've covered that one in the last Exploring the Black Country. It is an amazing place. So yeah, let's go move on. We've got stuff to cover further down the canal. Let's go and check out what's further on. So while this place is lovely, it comes from land from where it comes from. I mean, if you turn left, it will take you to another pool. But then you've got the canal, look at that. You've got the old bridges, toll end works. You've got another bridge down the bottom, constructed by the Horsey Company in the 18th century. So these are really old bridges. And further down, there is another old bridge down there. But it splits off. I mean, you've got Horn Basin on the left, or the number two canal from which I come from. And then down behind me is the BCM mainline through Neverton Tunnel. And if you keep going this way where I'm going, it will take you all the way to Stalbridge. It's a really long route. Done it before and it is really lovely on bike, but walking, I can imagine it takes really far. But look at that, a view from the, uh, the bottom down here, Toll End Works, look. If I quickly zoom in, I mean, them bridges are really old. And zooming back from there, look at the view from there, look. And down the bottom as well, you've got the old bridge, what you used to serve the coal mine. So you, tech goods over it that bridge is dating back quite a bit as well 
So right this way we are, the Bumble Island Warrens all local nature reserve. So I will be covering a video on this separate going later on in exploring the black country. But look at the map, I mean it just tells you different things. You've got Neverton Tunnel, you've got the Cobbs Engine House from where I come from. Toll Island, that's quite interesting, we'll have a look at history of that later. And a basin, what was this basin for, we'll cover that later on. But look at the history, I mean, you've got there, you've got Bumbleall as a rare example of a timber gallows crane, now protected as a scheduled ancient monument. I will have to try and find bits and pieces for that. You've got the Cobbs Engine House, Grey 2 listed, and I mentioned that, it's a mining seized in 1928. More there, Neverton Tunnel, 2,768 metres and in length, so that one is actually quite a long tunnel, 1.7 mile long. So you see there's quite a lot over here, I mean the bridge is, as I mentioned, constructed there, so 1830, uh, four cast iron foot bridges, and those were actually made in Tipton by the Horsey Company. It don't actually state there by the, um, by the Toll End Iron Works, yeah, Horsey Company I think it is, in the black country. But there, there's lots of information, wildlife, you've got the uh, yellow iris, so you can see there's a lot of plant life. But let's go and journey further down the canal. Nice interest in actually reading that. So yeah, coming further down, it is quite interesting watching them doing this. They're dredging the canal, so they've been here for weeks. The last time I come down, I've seen a lot of things being dragged out. As you can imagine all the silt, what's at the bottom of the canal, affecting barges, you've got stuff what's dumped. I mean, here's another one, look, Toll Ends Works, so here's another old bridge. But look at that, they're actually uh, in the dredging process. So it is nice to see them doing that actually, caring for the canals, really quite interesting. So zooming in, you can just actually see the dredging barge, look, look at that. So right, there is a bit of interest information here, so I'm just looking what this sign is, because there's a load of these signs down the Dudley number two and one canal. So this one here, the Cooper played an important role in the black country. The casks he made allowed the transportation of products all over the world. By rolling, uh, a man could move up to one and a half tonne using a barrel. Look at that. That's actually quite some interest information. So right, I don't think we're actually too far now from Lloyd's testing facility, which actually used to be the former site nearby of Hingeley's of Neverton. So I will teach you a bit of information about that, so I'll talk to you about what Hingeley's was. As many of you might know, Hingeley's of Neverton actually made the Titanic anchor going back many, many years ago. The story behind that, if you want to know where that anchor even come from, it's actually just down the road from here. Let's go and head down and we'll talk to you about Lloyd's testing facility. So right, I think just down onto the corner here, just what I'm looking at right now, that actually used to be the site, I believe, of Hingeley's of Neverton, just right there. So you can just see there's a bit of a brick wall in the distance. I was told it was on this back site, because so you had the Lloyd's testing facility, and then you had this site here, which is quite interesting. Now I'm marking here, there is actually a sign telling you about Hingeley's of Neverton, so let's go and take a look. So just here, a bit of information, it says this illustrious company works as the grandest and most respected anchor and chain manufacturer in the world for 150 years. Formed in 1838, it produced 1.90% of the world's anchors, including the Titanic anchor. So it is worth looking up, the Titanic anchor is quite interesting. A mass of the towering chimneys, as a vast as a city it employed, thousands of men used uh, millions of tons of iron and coke in the hungry furnaces. This monument is dedicated to the brave and skilled workers of Hingeley's. So I do believe this is actually the old site of Hingeley's of Neverton, just right there. I think where that brick wall is, and you've got like a factory there today, just right about the top. So coming round the corner, I think there is actually another 
whether it was this section I could be wrong but I do know it was located somewhere here because then round the corner you've got another bridge and then you've got the Lloyd's testing facility so but that is quite interesting reading that and it says there their names will forever uh, known for strength skill and pride so that is quite interesting reading that so let's go move on to Lloyd's testing facility and I will probably tell you a bit more about the hingelers of Neverton altogether So right just before Lloyd's testing facility we've got this, this is actually known as Assel's Bridge. There actually used to be graffiti I believe somewhere here and it says there, if I just pan around to show you, it says due to the graffiti saying Assel is the king cleaned off by the council and repainted regularly since his winning goal for West Bromwich Albion in the 1968 FA Cup final. I believe they've redone this bridge and I think the graffiti has actually disappeared. It actually used to be situated across the wall here. I do actually remember it saying Assel is the king and I think there was something over on that side as well which has been redone up. So that's Lloyd's testing facilities only around the corner now for you. So right, what you can see over there is quite interesting. This is actually the Lloyd's uh, testing house. So I'll just tell you a bit of information about it. It is really quite interesting. So Lloyd's uh, proving house tested the great chains and anchors for hinges, the surrounding area. And once their strength was proved, they will be hauled out and lifted onto wagons by their mammoth steam crane. The tracks of which can still be seen on the other side of the canal. So there is actually still tracks over there somewhere. So at one point, it would actually be quite interesting to see if the tracks are still over there, over on the waterside estate, so it might be worth a look at one point. But just right here, you can just see there's a really old chain. Look how heavy this chain is onto here, look. And it's really interesting. And the crane, I think there is like a little bit of like an old crane somewhere down the bottom. It's by where the, um, the canal ends and splits off onto the other section, so we'll go and take a look at that later. But that is quite interesting information about Lloyd's testing house. But we'll have a look to see if there's any more on hingeries of Neverton. So I do know he actually owned an old Victorian cottage. I don't know if many of you know where Drew's Holloway is. Just further right at the top, he actually owned an old cottage there known as Haverton Lodge. It got knocked down many, many years ago. And they're actually building something else on there. But if you do walk past it, there is an old plaque there stating that Noah Hingerly and his son actually lived at that site, which is quite in interesting. So N. Hingerly and Sons was a firm that originated in the Black Country region of the United Kingdom. It was founded by Noah Hingerley in 1796 to 1877, who started making chain near the village of Cradley. The firm moved to Neverton around 1852, where large-scale chain and anchor manufacturers' works were set up on the Dudley No. 2 canal. One of the most famous products of the firm was the anchor of the RMS Titanic, which on completion in 1911 was drawn through the streets of Neverton on a wagon uh, by 20 sheer horses so that is really quite interesting so the Titanic anchor there is actually a replica in Neverton itself where you go through the little like, town towards the top there is a replica there so a photo on now what the replica is actually like so that's quite an interesting thing to look at but you can imagine there is loads of history behind all this I will drop some links and if you are interested in reading much behind it because you can keep going on and on about chains is that much information about chains how they tested it by their strength and you know strength had to be tested to see what the chain could be used for if it was right so yeah that's basically what Noah Hingel is, is and the Lloyd's testing house itself let's go and head further down the canal line and see what interesting information we can uncover
So right here we are and we've actually made it to the bridge that I do want to show you because there is a little bit of interesting things down onto this section, even something geological. So we'll get close up and we'll um, show you what it's all about. So right, I think that was actually constructed in 1858 by the looks of it. So I can just see up there, there is like a little date on a little like bit of a plaque up there. Look, 1858, really dating old. And you can just see right there where we're standing right now would have been a very old tunnel, believe it or not. This is actually called the Bruins Tunnel. So you've got a bit of interesting information there, Bruins Canal section, which is a geological site because you've got all this here, like the Wren's Nest, you've got all the old rocks. But look how much uh, rock formation is here, 100 million years worth of rock formation. Look at that. So I believe you never know, there could be fossils hidden within there, which is quite interesting. Look at all that lot. And there is here, if I just go down, this is actually known as High Bridge Road. Just onto the corner, so you can just see zooming in. It tells you the, the name of it there, look. But here, looking down, look how old this wall is. I think this would have actually linked up into a tunnel section, but the wall... You know that's all what's left of it so you can just see it comes round like a tunnel and it comes round like a tunnel there look so i believe it could have been possibly like a tunnel section but it's all been removed but it does actually sound like you're in a tunnel so i will show you in a minute it is really quite cool but seeing that that's interesting but i'll show you what the information is about that geological site so right it does say here bruins canal section is designated as a geological site of interest SSSI, I've missed a word out there because I wanted to cut it short. Uh, this site is part of Saltwell's local nature reserve. The rocks here were formed at two different periods with a gap about 100 million years apart. So you can just see there, I was actually correct. And it says there um, of the older and younger rocks. This site is of great importance in understanding the geological history of the West Midlands and the Britain as whole. But you can just imagine though, imagine uh, the wren's nest, how old that rock is when they did the Seven Sisters caverns, they did all the mines underneath, they found fossils, and back then the miners were quite, you know, was really happy because those fossils made money for the miners. And that's how all this lot began finding fossils and stuff like that. So, but it's really interesting to see how this is really old, and especially near the canal line itself. You can imagine all of that's formed over by rivers many many years ago so you can imagine a hundred million years ago there would have probably been forest there that could have been like a river flowing through a forest it's amazing now that all that's changed to what it is today and seeing canal down into here because there is pictures here what it would have looked like so according to this there would have been like a bit of like a forest above the big massive river running just directly where we're standing right now or it could have been many years ago the Solarium period uh, more than 400 million years ago so under the sea that's why you will probably find fossils within the wall which is probably why it's an interest so basically Bruins Canal is owned and managed by the British Waterways which is the Canal and River Trust today um, it was built in the 1792 as a contour canal following the edge in nearby Lodge Farm Reservoir the line was improved in 1838 when a tunnel was built here to straighten out a loop in the old route 20 years later, in 1858, the tunnel was opened up into a deep um, cutting that exists here today. So you see, it's opened up into a massive cut, which if I just moved down, this is quite interesting, you will actually hear this. Listen to the noise in a minute. But look at that, just right around the bridge. Let's have a test of this and see what it sounds like. Hello? Hello? You can just see, that's what's interesting about this, even though it doesn't seem like it would have been a tunnel here. I think it's the way this is actually designed, it's going like in a V. And because the sound is travelling up, it's going round above the ceiling, because sound travels fast. And back down and it's looping and looping. So if I do it again, hello? You can just see the sound is looping over and over again, because it's curling. The sound is curling around the wall and coming back behind me, then going back up. The sound does travel in the direction. So if I did it from this area, you can just see my uh, point of what I'm on about. Hello? Hello? So you can just see, it only does it when you're close towards the bridge, right around underneath. That's because you can see how sound travels. So it's quite interesting understanding as well how sound even travels. Hello? That is crazy. You can just see by the side of me, we're not even in a tunnel. 
<laughs> that is crazy, that is. So that is basically um, High Bridge Road above, which I'm going to plan to take if I can't get down the bottom to get to St Andrew's Church. But there is a bit of interesting information here. It does tell you about Bruins Tunnel. So the navigators hit a massive basalt rock, forcing them to cut Bruins Tunnel. It was opened out in 1858, saving the leggers a tiresome job. Well, so that's basically the bit what I wanted to show you. So let's go and move on. Let's go and see if we can see any extras. But I do want to get to St Andrew's Church now and try and show you all that interesting information about the cholera outbreak in the 1800s. So right, this church is quite interesting. Now I have tried to find the graves of the cholera outbreak that happened in the black country during the 1830s. But it does say here, St Andrew Church in Neverton is an Anglican parish church situated in Neverton in the metropolitan borough of Dudley. Just a short walk up a big steep hill from the Dudley number two canal. You can actually come from it from that way. The building was designed by Thomas Lee and opened in 1830. A woman just told me that she believed it opened in the 1840s, but it opened in 1830 with the history. In 1844, it became the parish church for Neverton. But where these graves are situated, apparently these uh, graves are unmarked somewhere within the church. Now, I've had a good walk around. I've seen most of the graves, like 1860s, 1850s, but I don't go anywhere behind that. So the church is actually grade two listed. So that was actually designated on the 1st of August in 1977. The year this church was built was 1827, completed like to 1830. It cost around about £8,000 to build this church. Imagine back then, £8,000 would have been a lot of money back in them days, I can just imagine. Uh, the materials it was actually built with was gone or stone and brick. So if I just pan around, you can actually just see the church right the way there. So that's actually St Andrew's Church. Cause that looks very old on the corner. And you've got the, uh, the tower up there, look, you've got the clock. Nice architecture at the top, it's like castellated right the way up there, look. But well, would love to see him there, but I don't know when that's open. So I bet you've got to book an appointment to go in that church. I might throw the number one down, cover a separate video on this altogether. But if I just pan back around, it does actually say, um, it's going down, down. It says, Neverton, like many black country industrial areas, contained many non conformist chapels. It did not have an Anglican church until the 16th of July 1830 when St Andrews was consecrated and opened by the Lord Bishop of Worcester. The foundation stone of the church had been laid by Dr Brooker, the vicar of Dudley, on the 30th of November 1827. The building designed by Thomas Lee was a commissioner's church funded by Parliament. Now going down, this is the bit interesting bit. The churchyard contains the mass or mock graves of the victims of the cholera outbreak that struck Dudley in 1831 and 1832. So what is cholera? I've, I've never heard of it and many people might say, you, you know, I've asked somebody else that walked past, do you know, what it, do you know where the graves are? She goes, what's cholera? Now basically it's a very old disease what I cured. Now cholera comes from the Greek word, I think it's a uh, Kali or something like that, K-H-O-L-E. Uh, transmission of the cholera usually occurs through the facial oral route because of contaminated food or water caused by poor sanitation. Back in the Black Country days, Tipton was known for its poor sanitation. The first cholera pandemic began in 1816 in India and eventually spread by trade routes affecting China, Europe and North America and the remainder of the world. It was a deadly disease that killed tens of millions of people including the most elite such as the French King Charles X, American President James K, Polk and French uh, Solite uh, Madame uh, Recamia. Now going down, because it was so dangerous people were concerned. This resulted in a group of British gentlemen being appointed by the Poor Law Commissioners to examine the conditions of the London Poor Houses. After our examination they uh, provided the following 22 tips that are published in an article, Remedies Against the Cholera. Their 22 tips are provided here almost uh, 
verbatim so if you want to read this i will drop a link in the description it tells you all about it all the different things what they did reliefs remedies you know it's really quite interesting reading the old remedies what they did to try and cure a disease well but you can imagine it, the epidemic of cholera how dangerous it was especially in the black country how it spread so i mean the victorians had good advice on how to cure it but it says there um, the bacteria responsible for cholera was not isolated until 1854 by an italian anatomist oh well so yeah drop links in the description about the church about the outbreak of the disease and much more i will drop all the links for all the stuff in this video in the description so if you want to go ahead after this video and learn much more about all these different areas what i'm covering today feel free to because you know all of it is really interesting there's, there's always a bit of information about anything around here i mean the next part where i'm going to is gray's book iron works where it was actually situated on the canal line and actually made parts of the bouncing bomb let's go and check out what it's about and there is a sign telling us about it all together so yeah just to mention the bridge in front which is zoomed in on it's like a bit of like a black it's got white onto it it's a quickly show it yeah this is actually a bridge constructed by the Horsey Company in the 1800s in Tipton. So similar to the bridges you would have seen at a bumble or saying Toll End Works onto them. So you can just see there, zooming right the way in, look at that. So you can just see this is actually the beginning of all the old bridges. So there is actually more, the further you go down the canal, you will just start to see most of these appear. And you've got a cattle bridge there which links onto the, the top end where you can walk all the way up to the church. You can just see about the church from here. I think if I just go a bit further around, you will actually see it. So yeah, that's where I was, right away on top of that hill. You can actually see that church from Merry Hill if you go shopping, just where Iceland is. I think if you look down, you can actually see where the uh, the church is right around top of the hill if you turn around and look. But there, the view of that looks like further up. So I was on a very steep hill. You could see a nice view of the uh, the Merry Hill site itself and the surrounding area. So it was nice being up there. But this bit here, I don't know what this cattle bridge is, whether that is really old, or whether there's any dates behind it. But the wooden bits underneath it look really old. So right, something quite interesting. I don't know whether many people have actually noticed this, but right here, there is a couple of uh, derelict houses. Well, I think they've burnt down many, many years ago. They've been left for so many years. I've come up here sometimes and I've actually got inside one of them. The conditions in one is really bad, but if you go in the other, it's really good inside, apart from the top floor. I think the fire spread to the, the next floor, but it didn't affect the downstairs. But then buildings are just by Black Book Bridge here. But there is a bit of information. If I have a quick look, it does tell you. It says there, the Black Country. Um, so if I take a bit of information about what it is. But it says here the black country um the black country is what it is and where it is because of what is underneath it beneath us is more concentrated wealth of minerals more than anywhere else on the earth iron stone limestone like dudley limestone mines the wren's nest and the thickest coal in europe can be found within it's just a shovel the land was so exploited that there was barely a living thing on the surface this scarred the landscaping became known as our black country to what it is today as you can just see there a little like a uh, plaque of the coal mining like a uh, wheel things what dropped them down that's really cool coal mining is really interesting and you can just see if you've noticed that that is actually supposed to be inside the tunnels where they worked and that is actually the support beams for the ceiling that is quite an interesting little plaque that so if you ever come down here by black book bridge you, you might have noticed that going by there is a lot of these and it does help people to understand what, what the black country is about. It's like I was thinking to myself earlier, I mean, you think many generations and generations from us, not many people are going to understand what the black country is just about because we're all modern today. Most of our stuff's made abroad and most of the factories are closed. You imagine Round Oak still works where we're going now to where about it was. That went, a um, lot of uh, chain making companies gone. It's all done differently today, ironworks all that kind of stuff, coal mining, we don't really do coal mining around here anymore. All shut down when they, the mining strikes happened, the most of them in the early 1900s from floods and they, um, they capped off the entrances to them. But you imagine, imagine if coal mines were still going today, what would, what would it actually really look like? You imagine all the black smoke travelling over, you could barely see daylight, you imagine back in them days, 
many of the older people might say, you know, but it was all foggy back then in the daytime as well as nighttime, they could not see a thing. Because there was that much industrial going, not just the coal mine, so it caused that much smoke. And the reason why they've stopped all this today is because they believe the pollution is causing effects with the atmosphere. And back then, and they're trying to blame, you know, it was from all the stuff back then what's caused it. That's what they're trying to cut down on energy and all these different kinds of things. But those days were the days. That's where manufacturing was called manufacturing. Not like today, it was all done by hand. Can you imagine chain making when I talked about hinges of Neverton. And I had many men who worked just on one chain just to construct it. Big chains worked for like ships and stuff like that. It's just really fascinating that many young people today, you know, some of them don't know much about the black country history because I'm not really taught much about it. And this is why I inspire people with doing these videos to teach you more about what the past was about, showing you an area and then showing you what it would have looked like back in the black country days or teach you what was there at all. So it is really good. So that's basically what the black country is about. It's about the coal mine, it's about hard living. Uh, many people say hard drinking because that's what it was about back in the days getting your new wages having a good day out at the pub you know that's what it was all about the black country you know and today it's just all completely changed so right where we're standing right now is a very very old area there used to be a factory here called Graysbrook Ironworks now that actually used to be situated just right over there where I'm pointed because if I just turn around there is a really old bridge and many people might wonder what this even is this is an old walkway bridge over to the other side where the factory was situated and today they are building new factories just onto the land where it actually was all together now marking the site there is a plaque here telling you saying here that in 1943 the casings um, were made for the bouncing bomb of the dam busters fame in Gray's Book Ironworks which stood uh, behind you the success of this engineering marvel was one of the greatest triumphs of World War II. So yeah, it is quite interesting seeing that information, you know, 1943 when that bouncing bomb stuff was made, just behind me where the ironworks was, it's really fascinating just to even uh, learn about what was there. And that's why these boards are quite interesting to learn people what was there back in the past, because down there, what I'm looking at right now, there is even old stuff down there. You've got back into the mining industry, You've got the Dudley Tunnel, which serves the limestone mines. And today, there is many abandoned mines that have been undiscovered under the ground over there. So there is loads and loads of stuff. I mean, one area has so much history, it's just amazing. And to see the bridge as well, the old footbridge, what linked over to the other side of the factory. Wow, that is really quite cool. So yeah, interesting stuff. So let's step back in time now. Let's go and take a look at some very old photographs to see what the Black Country days was like back then. Much interesting stuff to compare to what it is today. So enjoy the rest of the cinematics I have for you with the photographs and let's see what the black country is like by stepping back in time.
Yeah, really quite interesting that he's seen the old photographs off the black, which is some things in Dudley. You know, them were the days, apparently, to some of the people in, in the generations that lived then. But yeah, let's go down, let's go and take a look at where the Parkhead Junction is now. And we'll go and take, check out the Dudley Tunnel bef before moving down onto the, uh, the factories down the bottom, what was there, the, uh, the Round Oak Steelworks. And then you've got this building here. Many people might wonder what this is. I believe it's an old pumping station um, for the water from down onto the next section of the canal line. I think that's what it is. It's an old pumping station. There's the old cottage right the way there, look. Just onto that corner. That is really old. It does date back to the 1900s. Then you've got the Parkhead Viaduct, which is just right next to it, just by that cottage. If I have a quick look, you can start to see the, uh, the bridge start to appear because there was a lot of scaffolding on it just right there. Let's go and take a look at that, that's going to be quite interesting seeing that when all the scaffolding's gone. So yeah, this is quite interesting, we've got a bit of information here, Parkhead Locks, tells you much of information, you've got Pear Tree Lake Colliery, derelict on there, look, which it says, uh, Graysbrook uh, Blowing Engine, it gave the name to the Blowers Green Bridge and Blowers Lock, you can see there's something there, uh, Starbridge Glaze Brick Company, um, canal cottages, that's actually an old canal cottage there. And it does say where formerly one house, Benjamin uh, Rollison, the stoker of Parkhead Engines, lived here. So that's actually where he lived, in that cottage right there, because it does date back to the 1900s, like mentioned earlier. But it says there, John Snape, with John Bull, originally surveyed the land needed for the creation of the link between the Dudley Canal and Birmingham Canal through the new tunnel. So that actually will take you all the way to the BCM main line if you go through the Dudley Tunnel through the limestone mines. So it is a big actually uh, canal section there, goes pretty far in. So um, there is a map here, but it's like showing it's faded out. It tells you about the canal linking through Dudley Tunnel. Um, it says there, uh, this map was drawn in 1785 by John Snape before Duddy number 2 canal was built and lock number 5 removed just onto there, shame it's not, not visible. Shame these aren't visible as well, it's faded out quite bad. Um, but there, it says there, a photograph uh, above, very faint, I think that's actually nearby, was taken looking from the lock number 4 in 1956. Uh, Blower's Green Pump House, which was behind me, was probably built in the 1890s. Like I did say, that pump house is really old. I did see an old photo of it online. So there, it says Parkhead Locks and Dudley Tunnel were built between uh, Dudley and Starbridge Canals and Birmingham Canal Network. Dudley Tunnel also provided a much shorter route for the Birmingham goods to be reached to the Severn and the sea. Uh, several people were affected by the new canal link. Lord Ward agreed to sell the land to Parkhead to accommodate the locks, but was never paid. The new tunnel will bypass parts of the canal system for uh, which tolls were normally due. So the two canal companies who would lose out, the Staffordshire and Worcestershire and Birmingham Canal Companies, insisted that the 1785 Act included compensation payments for those uh, lost earnings. This provision was repealed in 1835. Really quite interesting information, so that is actually bits and pieces of the local area itself. Let's go and take a look down, I will show you a closer view of the old cottage and then the Parkhead uh, Junction just right about the top. So yeah, this is actually that old cottage, you can just see it's boarded up still. I don't know whether it's still classed as derelict um, or what I'm doing to it at all. I know there was actually um, a back way to have a look around this age ago, but they've actually nailed it shut. But looking at that, I mean, there is some like plaque things, like a, a chain mark on the wall saying 156, which you can just see right there. Um, but looking at it, imagine how old this dates back. I mean, some of the brickwork is just crumbling. There would have been an old door on there, very old windows. Um, but looking by the side of it, I don't have you had to see anything. Yeah, that gate used to be open, they've actually blocked it now. But wow, it is nice seeing that old cottage. But just right in front, you've got the, uh, the bridge. They're starting to remove some of the scaffolding. Let's go and take a look what they've been doing down here. Oh, wow. <laughs> just about to tell you some history, but look at all these pigeons all the way lined up. <laughs> they think they're coming for food. Look. <laughs> a lot of pigeons. I haven't got any food, sorry. <laughs> So right, that all over there, what I'm doing works on, I've got a bit of information there. So Parkhead Viaduct is a railway viaduct in Dudley, West Midlands. 
the original viaduct was a wooden structure erected in 1850 so I thought it was really old so that's actually why they're supporting the bridge and doing the work today. So it used to carry the Oxford, Worcestershire and Wolverhampton Railway over the Parkhead Locks and the Dudley Canal near to the southern uh, mouth of the Dudley Tunnel which is right around over there so that's we're heading down in a second to show you. Uh, the current brick viaduct was built in 1890 and it's believed that the original wood the original wooden structure is still in case with its successor so I think that's actually why they're repairing it I believe as well uh, looking down um, 1890 when the construction ended uh, so used there uh, the use of the viaduct had fallen by the 1960s due to the closure of passenger stations on the route but the line remained open till March uh, 1993 when a section of railway between Warsaw and Brawley Hill was closed the most recent train believed to have crossed the viaduct was a cable lane train on the 1st of July 1993, nearly four months after the line's closure. The section of the track over the Parkhead viaduct was removed about 1995, with most of the track being uh, Highgate Road and Blowers Green Road, following in 1998 due to the construction of a new road bridge over a line nearby. The structure of the viaduct is still intact but has fallen into disrepair and will undergo uh, refurbishment in order to be reutilised. With 2023 being the likely completion date, it's going to take quite a few years. So the Wendbury to Brawley Hill extension for the West Midlands Metro tram network. So there you go, a bit of information on the Parkhead uh, Bridge there, just onto the corner. So there's lots of information, you imagine if I just pan around, you will just see this is actually the canal section now, what would have been used to go through the Dudley Tunnel. Uh, to go through to the limestone mines so nice little interesting route so if you've never been to the limestone mines from the black country museum section it is definitely worth going down there I've, i really enjoy it i want to go back again in the summer uh, when i go to the black country museum so we'll get on to that one but let's go and journey down now let's go and show you what the dudley tunnel looks from this side of the canal section so right, just right behind me right now is the Dudley Tunnel, constructed in 1884 for this section right the way here. goes right the way in, it's really dark in there, so you can imagine that meets the, the mine sections where they do the tours today. So that, that will link back into the Dudley Tunnel once more and back out to where the, I think it's where the office is, you've got the cafe and you've got the, the little entrance where you get onto the boat, so it will lead there by the Black Country Museum, then all the way to the BCM main line, so it is quite a long distance route. But it's nice to see that the entrance is still like the way it would have been back in the old days. Really cool that is. And uh, I would love to go through this Dudley Tunnel section. I've never been through it but I do do boat tours. We'll have a quick look. Let's have a sneak peek and see what it's like inside the tunnel. Just by looking in. So I'm going to be a bit, bit careful. That is really long. It's really dark in there as well. Look, see so if I zoom in. It goes dark halfway through it. Let's have a quick shout and see how far it is. Hello? Hello? That goes far, right far in, look. Lovely little bit of tunnel. You can just see there is like a bit of old wood and a bit of chain underneath there. If I have a quick look, I don't have to see it. But this chain, that's running all the way across, look across the side. So that would have been there back in the old days as well. So it's original chain. What it was used for, I just really don't know. But there might be a bit of a history behind what that was actually used for down the tunnel. Most of the tunnels down here, they would have done legging across here. So they legged the way through the tunnel itself. That's where the tunnels are really narrow. So you can imagine back in them days, how long it took them to leg through the tunnel. You'd have many barges coming through with goods or the limestone on. And they're waiting to come across because they're taking time because it took ages to leg through these tunnels. Very hard job and very, you know, hard work for them back in the black country days.
so right we're not actually too far now from the round oak steelworks this is actually where it's actually situated just further down the bottom down here let's pan around we'll have a look at some old bridges so you can just see this is actually the canal now where it parts off by it look there is some old stuff if we come around the corner any moment I think these are old walls there is something really old in the edge as well it's coming up to now I think it is you can just there look at the old wall just in the distance and there is like a little bit of an old like a uh, thing there if I zoom in carefully you can see it a bit better now it's uh, winter you see that black thing sticking up look like a tripod so whatever that was actually for I know there's an old photo I've seen on Round Oak still works and that's actually there that's actually quite cool seeing that so all the land now on there would have been where all the Round Oak factories would have been situated all the way down to where the waterfront is today down that section there is a bit of a new bit there at the moment where there would have been some old factories there once more but let's have a, a quick stop you can just see zooming in there is the old if I point to them lights for the Round Oak Steelworks look so you got the lights there would have been the old like rail line where you used to load the goods on to transport across that line down at the back I think it is actually still used and looking round, much derelict land, it's just got a lot of icy land today, I don't know what I'm doing with it at all, we have to, any future plans for like any factories, any houses, but well, it's nice to still see that they're actually still using a bit of the land for it. So for people who want to know about what the Round Oak Steelworks actually was, there's a bit of information here, so a few photos on for what the Round Oak would have looked like from the canal line itself, some really good old photos there to show you. So basically, the Round Oak Steelworks was a steel production plant in Brada Hill, formerly Staffordshire, England. It was founded in 1857 by Lord Ward, who later became in 1860 the first Earl of Dudley, as an outlet for pig iron made by the nearby blast furnaces. During the Industrial Revolution, the majority of iron making in the world was carried out within 32 kilometres of Round Oak. For the first decades of operation, the works produced wrought iron. However, in the 1890s, steel making was introduced. At its peak, thousands of work people were employed at the works. The steelworks were the first in the United Kingdom to be converted to natural gas, which was supplied from the North Sea. The works were nationalised in 1951, privatised in 1953, and nationalised again in 1967. Although the private firm Tube Investments continued to part and manage the operations at the site, the steelworks closed in December 1982. Some more interesting photos there for you of the factories. It's just amazing just to see it. So it actually does say here it was actually demolished in 1984. Seen some very off video on YouTube of like an old documentary and it was actually all here. Person walking past, it was all derelict land. They was about to demolish it. I uh, don't know where about it is on YouTube, but it's really quite interesting. So the Ward family, Lords of Dudley Castle, came to own and control a wide range of industrial concerns in the black country of the 19th century. The family owned land in the region as well as the extensive mineral rights. In 1855, the Dudley estate uh, commenced the construction of Round Oak Iron Works at Brother Hill under supervision of the estate's mineral agent, Richard Smith. The site was next to the Dudley Canal and two railway systems. As I did mention, there is like a bit of a rail line at the back, which is still used today. So uh, it says there, the public railway run by the Oxford, Worcestershire and Wolverhampton Railway and the Pensnet Railway. A mineral line opened by the Dudley Estate itself, also nearby where the new level furnace is, also known as the new level furnace is where blast furnaces owned by the Dudley estate could supply pig iron for the new ironworks at Round Oak. The ironworks uh, commenced production in 1857. It was large-scale operation and on its opening it employed 600 men. And the equi equipment included 28 puddling furnaces and 5 mills. In 1862 the works won a prize medal at the International Exhibition. The works were extended in 1865 and 1868 and they were capable of producing 550 tonnes of finished iron per week. In 1889 the company started producing chains and ship cables. Wow, quite interesting information there. Lots behind this factory. And steel production, the demand for iron began to fall from the 1870s as steel production began to compete with traditional iron products and it was decided to convert the plant to steel production 
which was what it was actually called round Oak Steelworks. 1890, the Dudley Estate sold the ironworks to a new public company, which would aim to convert steel production. The price of the work was set as £110,000, which £10,000 was paid in cash as the remainder by mortgage provided by the Dudley Estate itself. The company passed to the Lancashire Trust and Mortgage Insurance Company Limited, which floated the shares in the firm to the public, receiving £135,000. The new company was called the Earl of Dudley's Round Oak Iron and Steelworks and was incorporated on the 16th of April 1891. Some interesting information about a round oak there, so you can imagine all that land when it was actually used. Still disused down part of it. And then you've got this. I think there is like a little bit of a road to the factories above this. I believe Round Oak Steelworks may have used this back in the past. It's actually Norwich, a British steel bridge, right onto the corner, look at that very old i can see it's actually rusting onto some certain sections so it's actually still being used look i mean panning round i mean look at that up there really old so yeah that's it about it for exploring the black country we will resume back down the canal line from the delph locks in another episode down to starbridge that's one that i want to cover separately i'll have to get up here a certain route to get to there but an amazing trip, I've really enjoyed it, but it's absolutely freezing, I am cold. I didn't expect it to be this cold today, I thought it was supposed to warm up, but we come into November, you've got to expect the cold weather now. But yeah, thank you very much for watching, if you've got this far, there will be more interesting episodes like this one, much history and much more, but see you soon and take care everybody, and thank you for watching Exploring the Black Country, over and out.